Hello, my name is Tirthankar Dev. I am a second year MBA student and a fellow at the Center of Digital Strategies at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. I'm pleased to welcome Chris Resenders, founder and president of Inex Advisors. And he is joining us today as part of Read Technology Impact series for Internet of Things. Uh, Chris, uh, welcome to Tuck and thanks for being here. So Chris, to kickstart the discussion, why don't you talk uh, more about you know the company Inex Advisors and what you do? Inex Advisors is kind of a hybrid firm. We're a consultancy first. Mm -hmm. um, we conduct a lot of our own intelligence collection, uh, specifically on the demand side, mm -hmm. uh, into the individual market or the enterprise market or the public sector market for Internet of Things solutions. Um, we're advising Fortune 50 or 500 companies, mm -hmm. both in technology, but also on the deployment side. Um, we're also in the process of creating something called Inex Investments out of Europe. The intention with Inex Investments is to invest in impact Internet of Things startups, companies that will address grand challenges with intelligent instrumentation of the physical world, mm -hmm. uh, food security, water security, energy, transportation, or population health security will be the areas of focus for that fund. In parallel, we'll continue to advise large enterprises and large information technology companies about how we think the market might evolve. Mm -hmm. So with the investments arm, you look out for you know the next big thing in this space? Well, I, I, certainly that's part of it, yeah. but I think what's really important and what we understand is that there's likely to be a fair amount of fragmentation mm -hmm. in, in the way the market develops, and we think that'll cause um, or drive significant fragmentation in technical approaches, uh, business models, monetization mm -hmm. schemes. And so I guess in a way, we'd like to find the business models or the technical approaches that we think will scale mm -hmm. and become influential. But we think for a time, part of our value add will be sorting through which models we think will work right. and which won't. But the fragmentation, I think, itself, I think classical information technology analysis or tech market analysis would say those are inefficient markets. And there's OPEX in those markets, and it's hard to scale. And where's the margin? We think all that inefficiency, all the fragmentation represents a massive opportunity. So Chris, could you talk uh, about one of the portfolio companies? Uh, sure. Um, one of them is a, a, a project called True Road, which we're building out of a, a university uh, in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And what it's building is a sensor suite that'll be uh, reliable, that'll be cost effective, and that'll deploy a number of different wireless methodologies so that we can have a cost effective, operationally effective, and financially feasible way to instrument national security or natural disaster implicated mm -hmm. roads, bridges, and tunnels. And so not all roads, bridges, and tunnels have the same sort of use case scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, those that have uh, a defense implication or have an evacuation implication uh, really need to be instrumented so that uh, emergency responders or citizens who live near one of these natural disasters can know in real time, mm -hmm. is this road safe? Is this bridge safe? Is this tunnel safe? Interesting. And so the concept behind the project isn't quite that simple. Um, that's the nice base case. But what happens after that is imagine having all of that intelligence available to private industry as they need to do things like real-time dynamic route optimization. So if you've got a large truck that's hauling um, timber, for example, mm. or hauling glass or hauling stone, uh, that truck really needs to be on a very tight schedule. And to be in a traffic jam right. because a bridge has a seasonal load restriction or there's an accident, um, that's not the kind of stuff that you can get from, say, uh, Waze or from Google yeah, Maps. Exactly. You've got to get the intelligence out of the road. And so that's one of the projects we're working on. It's early phase, mm -hmm. early stage. It's got some federal funding. It's got some private funding. It's one that we're pretty proud of. You know, Chief of uh, Cisco, John Chambers, uh, he was talking about how Internet of Things will generate about $19 billion of revenue by 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure the viewers would be interested to know what are the other ways of monetizing the space apart from energy savings? Which other ways do you see? Sure. So um, the folks at Cisco have a very deep understanding of the opportunity in Internet of Everything. Mm -hmm. um, we think the folks at General Electric do also. One of the reasons why I think those two companies are in the leadership positions they're in is because they're understanding that monetization um, will, the monetization models will reflect the fragmentation in the market. This won't be sort of a homogenous, pure play, right. Internet of Things as ad platform, or Internet of Things as productivity tool for uh, workforce reduction, mm -hmm. or you know, purely for asset utilization optimization. Those are all business cases, but they're one, two, three of hundreds. And so I think the way that the Internet of Things gets monetized is probably by looking at certain classes of assets 
And so in, in, in the last example, we talked about, say, roadways, for right. example. Well, there's another project where we know a couple of brilliant entrepreneurs who have found, we think, a way to, again, operationally, technically, and financially appropriate mm -hmm. uh, instrumentation of groundwater wells. But their concept isn't just to provide the data to the property owner who cares about having that water, but there are many other stakeholders who dig those wells, service those wells, build those pumps, uh, service those pumps, and, and those six or seven stakeholders who might see value in paying a fee to have access to a subscription about that well. Now, pull back from that and think about the local or regional municipal water resources management authorities. Mm -hmm. Man, would they love to get some access to that data? Well, there's a way, I think, we think, to conceive of um, an information architecture that could enable a subscription architecture mm -hmm. that could give different stakeholders access to different data sets with different resolution, with different frequency, different persistence, anonymization or aggregation at different levels of fee basis, for example. The key to all that is to understanding before you start putting the instruments in the ground, how do you want to manage that data? Right. And, and we talk about a model around digital rights management for IoT, mm. where in that, what we propose is that the asset owner or the individual or the entity that owns the asset, in this case, it would be the land that has the well in it, uh, they own the data. Mm. Yeah. And that they ought to be in a partnership with their service providers or their IoT service provider to talk about the possibilities to release some of that information to different stakeholders under different sets of conditions. Right. But that it ought to be conceived of early, mm -hmm. it ought to be reviewed often, and it ought to be fairly transparent. I'm sure adv uh, advertisers would be <laughs> a big customers in that. Well, uh, there, there will always be an advertising component, <laughs> yeah. I think, to Internet of Things business models. But what's, I think, different about the INEX approach on the advisors and investment side mm -hmm. and with our clients and portfolio companies is we are specifically not interested in building businesses that need to have an advertising revenue right. stream. What that does is it forces you to focus. It's some of those design experiments where you force restrictions or yes. you force considerations on design teams. In this case, we say, imagine you will never have an advertising or remarketing revenue stream opportunity. It forces you to focus more on why would I instrument this asset inventory or area of operation? Why would I put IoT in this place? Mm -hmm. If you cannot create authentic value for the primary asset owner or inventory consumer, then you probably are going to have some challenges to scaling that and keeping it profitable and keeping it an interesting investment over time. Mm -hmm. So advertising, yes, but for us it's not a primary concern. And in many cases, um, we're trying to design businesses mm -hmm looking at advertising as a real benefit, second, third, fourth, fifth order. So one of the other data points that uh, people are talking about is uh, a survey from Gartner. Yes. And according to Gartner, you know, there are already 900 million units of connected uh, devices which are installed, and that's from 2009. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be about 26 billion units mm -hmm. by the year of 2020. Yes. So I think in the next few years, standardization will emerge out as a big, big you know, uh, benchmark, and what do you think? You know, there are so many different uh, standardizations right now. Zigbee True. is one of them. What do you think will prevail in the market? So, whether it's uh, Gartner or IDC, mm -hmm. the numbers are huge. Right. Um, and whether it's um, the definition of IoT as having a cellular connection, some people call that machine to machine. Yes. Or having a Wi Fi connection, some people would call that smart home. Mm -hmm. The big definition. I believe that we may have more unattended device or IoT connections on the planet today than we have cell phone connections. And I think it's possible that if you put all PCs and mm -hmm. all smartphones and maybe even all servers and storage and switch platforms together, you still might find that IoT has more connections to a network and then ultimately the internet mm -hmm. than even the infrastructure. So the scale is enormous, first point, you're right. The second one is the fragmentation we talked about earlier. Um, when we're talking about IoT, we're talking about instrumenting the physical world. Right. And all of that chaos, I mean, the things that are outside walls or outside fences that we aren't subject necessarily to climate control or aren't subject necessarily to strict schedules in their consumption or in their access rights or rules. And so I think that will drive a massive fragmentation in use cases, mm -hmm. which then drives, there will be no one network connection. It won't all be 4G LTE. Right. It won't all be 5G or even 3G. It won't all be sort of split between long range with cellular and short range with Wi-Fi. There are many different wireless protocols that have different uh, benefits, 
different mm -hmm. risks, different right. costs, different weaknesses. And so when you ta start talking about the Z collection, you know, yeah. Z-Wave and Zigbee, um, they serve very specific and, and very high value functions in certain use case scenarios. But when you move outside their core markets, the value proposition starts to fade on one dimension or another. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? For us, it means when we look at our investments and we look at our clients and we work on their projects, we say, we're going to have to be a little bit agile. We can commit to a primary connection methodology, but we think there's a fairly significant risk to choosing one and not being prepared yeah. to support multiple. Now, when you move outside connectivity, of course, people start talking about APIs and they start talking about th this idea that we need standards. We absolutely need standards. There will be many, and I think it'll be fragmented for a long period of time. Um, think about right now, you know, TCP IP didn't just emerge when the internet was exactly. created. Right. I mean, you know this, you know, in your background, <laughs> right? You know how many standards we had to negotiate yep. through over the past 20 years. Um, I've got a little bit of experience in industrial automation where someone said, industrial ethernet. And 10 years later, there were still nine different instantiations that needed to be managed. So I think protocol translation, mm -hmm. protocol harmonization, protocol synthesis, I think it'll be a functional requirement. It'll be part of the overhead of deploying IoT for a decade or more. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that should stop people from considering investment on any dimension. I think it's just, it's the natural order of things. Highly fragmented market, some of it's new, some of it's got history. People forget this, right? Yeah. There's, I mean, there's still ADA being written exactly. for some infrastructure applications that, you know, these legacy or dead languages aren't dying. So standards is a critical piece of work that needs to be supported, mm -hmm. invested in on a persistent basis. I don't think it's going to be, you know, a three-year period of time and will arrive. I don't think it's going to work like that. Mm -hmm. But I think for those who are deploying or those who are developing, I think the concept would be, based on your use cases, what approaches make the most sense? for your customers based on their ROI requirements, based on their priority set of uh, either security or access requirements, and be prepared to participate in this, I don't know, alphabet soup for a period of time. Right. And uh, it's interesting that you brought up the security issues. Uh, there's a lot of talk going on, but we would be interested to know what keeps uh, Chris awake at night. Like, what's, <laughs> what's the biggest challenge for you? So. Um, so on the security side, so so we've got uh, we've got a, a, another project, another company that we work with in Chicago, and the name of that company is Tomato, mm -hmm. and it's the concept of that is rooted in the idea that uh, that architecture, their approach is, we'll arrive at a time in the future, maybe not so distant, mm -hmm. when all of those laws, Moore's law and Shannon's law, yeah. and all these other laws in tech, will enable us to endow the edge nodes, the little sensors with the kind of credentials where they could serve as their own policy enforcement points. Mm -hmm. They could serve essentially as their own session border controllers, maybe even their own VPN managers. The point is, we believe that security will be highly distributed. And as such, we'll start talking about this thing called a hardware root of trust. Okay. This idea that you can know and attest to every component on your board. And that's not what's happening today. No. And so for me, what keeps me awake at night is this idea that we will not go deep enough in understanding that there are many commercial challenges to creating a secure Internet of Things. And one of them is having a level of transparency um, and persistent penetration to understand exactly where your components are coming from, what their embedded capabilities are, mm -hmm. um, and what the intentions were of the suppliers. Because I think what you read about, all these trap doors and back doors and all this creeping, and all, uh, not all of it, but a lot of it, I think, can be compressed with something like a supply chain mm -hmm. that delivers on a hardware root of trust. So that's what keeps me awake is this idea that people will just race and connect and do it with a single concept in mind and then want to pivot three years mm -hmm. later and have an architecture that's just completely inappropriate for that pivot. Chris, on behalf of uh, Center of Detail Strategies at Tuck, I would like to thank you for being here and thank sharing you. our thoughts and insights. This has been Tirthankar Dev for the Center of Detail Strategies at Tech School of Business.